Welcome back, everybody, and as promised, part two of our Dogo Roundtable. Today on our episode, we have Mike C. with us, former president of DACA, the Dogo Argentino Club of America. He brings over 20 years experience with the breed, both keeping and hunting, and I think he offers some great expertise. Get ready and enjoy. This is going to be a banger, y'all. Hey, guys. How's it going? So, um, yeah, I don't, um, I don't know how much is going to be up there as far as history. But um, I uh, I was president of the DAC in the early 2000s and um, started hunting with dogos probably in the mid 90s with the Rinkins down in Texas when there was really not too no one else was doing that with dogos here at the time and I kind of got off on my own hunting with dogos probably around 2000 maybe 98 might have been a couple of years before 2000 somewhere around there and um, had about 20 years with the breed and up until about 2015 when I sent my last dogs down to my hunting partner due to uh, life circumstances changing, you know how that stuff goes. But, um, but yeah, so um, like me and Mitchell just talked about the other day, kind of plays into the same thing Gerardo was, uh, uh, was just talking about, which is that, um, is that, you know, dogs now versus dogs back in the day and how they're treated and how they're handled. And, and really the reality of, um, of the world that we live in right now and being able to preserve the Dogo's instincts going forward, you know, I think it's going to be challenging because uh, being able to hunt, drop dogs and hunt and people that have the ability to do that is that that's a dying breed, man. You know, it's a dying breed. Um, and I think that it's going to be harder to do in more places around the world as, you know, every decade goes by, you know, I'm pretty sure we can already see that happening in a lot of places. Right. So I think that um, like, like you and I were talking about, it's going to be challenging to try to preserve the instincts and temperament of the dogo because it already suffers as right now compared to how it was, you know, 20 years ago and 50 years ago, right? The dogs we have now, because they live in people's houses and and not on ranches, you know, like they're just they have a different mentality. All right, Mitchell, you and I talked about this the other day. Yep, that's exactly what I was going to bring up and actually uh, say if you wanted to mention. What are some things, for example, that you think a, a house dog may be raised um, in here that would hinder him from being a good hunter and vice versa? What are some things that you think a good top level hunting dogo goes through growing up that makes him not the best house dog? Because I think a lot of people that either don't have the breed or they're new to the breed, they don't really understand that it's a lot of nurture with that nature as well. And I wanted to kind of hint on that a little bit. Yeah, well, I think one of the big things is is that um, dogs that are, that are raised in the woods hunting and on a ranch, you know, uh, where they live that life from the beginning, um, their instincts are encouraged, right? You know, their hunting instincts are encouraged from the time they're, you know, eight weeks old, six weeks old. I guess take my puppies down to the hog pen at like eight or ten weeks just to walk around it, you know, and not obviously not put them in there because they have full grown hogs in there. But at eight weeks old, 10 weeks old, as soon as they could walk, I'd just take them down there and they would just be around hogs and boars. But I'm going to tell you, little dogo puppies, eight week old dogo puppies, see a, see a boar and all the hair in their back bristles and their tail goes straight up. And when you see that happen in a puppy that's eight weeks old, you know the fire's strong in them. You know, like that's what you look for. You look for that one that has that fire and already he's telling you something at that age. You know, so obviously you're not going to let him get in there because a boar would eat him like a little dogo McNugget. You know, but just to expose him to it and, and be around it and see it and smell it and know right off the bat that he that he hates him. You know, like it's in his blood to hate a boar, and they do. But so that thing, that's what doesn't happen when you raise a dog in the city. Like you don't have exposure from day one to their instincts, right? And like you and I talked about, and Mr. Mason talked about this in the interview that I shot with him the other day, which is that um, when dogs that grow up in the city are told no every day of their lives. No, don't do this. Don't chase that cat. Don't chase that squirrel. Don't jump up on the couch. Don't do this. Don't do that. You know, like they're told no about everything in their life. So when you go to take them hunting, it's hard for them to switch that off in their brain and just think now I can do now. Yes. Now it's yes. Now chase, you know, whatever it is I'm supposed to chase, run, leave, leave my owner side, go, go hunt. So that's the battle, you know, when you, and it's something that everyone's going to have to face going forward because, like I said, the days of just being able to raise dogos on ranches, you know, are over for a lot of people, you know. But, yeah, that's really the challenge is 
Dogos in, that grow up in the city are told no every single day of their life, what they can't do, what can't give into their instincts. And then to just take them to the woods and ask them or tell them it's okay and expect them to perform, that's the challenge. I think that's a big factor. I've seen people a lot of times introduce an older dogo to hogs or a, even a, a juvenile that they expect, you know, right off the back to run right in there. And they're, they're ready to get rid of the dog and cull it. But like you said, you know, that dog's been told, don't jump on the couch, don't chase the cat. When it did kill something, it got scalded for it. It, it's it's confused you know it's not they're not just machines even though we do want that fire to be in them they're still they're animals you know it's not fair i definitely agree yeah, I think that, that's a big thing we always used to tell people um when they were training their dogs is that exactly what you said they're not machines you know they're you know they're emotional and they're sometimes sometimes they're going to do one thing and the next time they're going to react completely differently and there's an old dog saying, I'm sure Jimmy knows this one, is never brag on your dogs or your kids because as soon as you do, they're going to embarrass you. Yeah. And it's, it's yeah. the truth. <laughs> That's it. It, it is. I've definitely the learned the people that you listen to. The, the people that you listen to are the ones that don't talk highly about their own dogs normally. It kind of goes hand in hand. The ones that, <laughs> that have their own dogs and kids on high horses, they, they never really live up to it in your eyes the same way that they see it. Man, as soon as you do, like I remember when I was young and fired up about this, I would dog this jam up hunter, and I'd be I'd be invited somewhere hunter hunt, hunting, and I'd I tell man my dog's jam up, and he's gonna like he hunts his he hunts his butt off, he's gonna hunt so hard, like man, like you don't even know, and so we'd drop dogs, and my dog would be sucking tailpipe the whole time behind a truck, you know, like we're hunting out of a truck, you stop the truck, he'd dump his head in the bumper because he's <laughs> walking behind it. You know, and every other time he's out hunting his ass off. And this one time he's going to embarrass me because that's what they do. That's, that's just how it that's is. Well, well, go ahead. All right, I said it's the truth. And I mean, it's not just with dogos. I, I mean, I, I do protection sports with my, with my other. Oh, yeah. I went to a, a protection <laughs> tournament a while back and my Dutch shepherd hasn't been outing. She won't out the thing. And I'm, I told all the decoys, I'm like, man, I'm going to have to choke her off you. I'm going to have to choke <laughs> her off you. That bitch was like, hold my beer. Watch me make a liar out of my mom. And out uh, every time. That's how it works, yeah. man. Yeah. It's important. To, it's an important lesson though. And I, I learned it the hard way like that is they're not machines. They're not going to react the same way every time. You know what I mean? Sometimes they're just going to take a day off. They're just going to be like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to do that today. You know? And, this is how it's going to be. So the, all of this makes it harder to evaluate dogs that you're bringing from the city and you're driving six hours to a place to go hunt, you know, 15, 15 hours for a place to go hunt. All of these factors come into play, right? You know, like the instincts that he's been scolded for. Now you want to see, you know, he's just been in a car for 15 hours. Everything's weird to him, you know, like to just to, to get um, to get the best of him in those situations is hard. So I think uh, we probably can agree that you still get the most out of your dog with the more you put into him, you know, not, not necessarily yeah. expecting something without giving it to him. Well, yeah, I think, it, I think you have to, what you have to keep in mind is that you can't make rash decisions on how good he is or is not going to be because he has all these things going against him, you know, 15 hour trip, all the instincts. So it just makes it harder to evaluate him. And I think you have to be a lot more patient with a dog like that. Versus a dog that's grown up from day one, you know, with hogs around him and hunting, you know, and that, that's really where I'm getting with this is it, it's harder to evaluate dogs like that. And I think it takes longer and you have to be more patient and you have to approach it in a different way than you would raising your own hunting dogs on your own, on your own land. Right. Like you can't, you can't be strict like you would with, with, you know, our dogs the way we did, you know, you have to make allowances and just understand that this is going to be a process. I'm going to probably going to have to make several 15 hour trips to go hunt my dogs before I really know yep. if they're, if they're going to have it because it's going to take them some time to adjust. Yep. Definitely. Definitely. I agree. I agree. Anyone have any thoughts? Well, on this? I didn't, I don't, I don't, jump in. Yeah, it's I, open to everyone. I mean, I, I think, I think it's definitely like something you know, talking about, for, you know, where the breed's going to go from here, because it very much is, is a, a dying thing. People raising dogs on ranches or people being able to go hunting. Um, I, I do think that's why, like, 
a lot of the performance sports are important because you're still using things like the dog's instinct and the dog's athletic ability. But again, it's the same, you know, a a dog raised in a sport home isn't raised in the same way that a pet's going to be raised. I mean, Eustace has been raised like a working dog because that's what I do. I raise working dogs. I raise, you know, Dutch Shepherds and Malinois that I want to go on to bite people. And, and yeah. it's very much the same as, as, as what Mike was saying. Like you don't tell them no all the time. You have to make sure that you, you keep those inhibitions available and there because you can easily crush a dog and you can crush their instincts and, and their abilities, you know? That's, so. that's good to hear that coming from you. I think a lot of people will need to hear that because we, we would see a picture of, Eustace on the ear of a of a hog. We see a picture of her maybe laying next to you in the bed, cuddled up. You know, it's very easy for a beginner to just say, like, why isn't my dog doing that? You know, I want to just do that. But there's a different well, I mean, story it, in the dog. There, there was <laughs> a lot of work that got put into her that people don't see. You know, when I got Eustace, I was living in a town home and I I had, you know, all these Malinois and stuff and and in my mind, I was like, God, I can't take her hunting. I can't do these things, but what can I do to help build these things? And, and I used to, yeah. and, and my best friend, Cassie would laugh at me, but I would take chamois to work. And we, we have Sinclair's at work and they're very wild hoggish looking creatures. <laughs> and, and I would rub these chamois on it and I would take it home and I would play games with her. Like I would a drug dog, like I would trail it or I would hide it and we would search for that that hog smell you know and then we would play tug with it we would so I I mean I I think that while you can't raise not everybody has the ability to raise them on the ranch there is definitely things people can do if they want to help a dog succeed in that way you know Uh, um I mean, and we'll see. I mean, I hope to get another puppy soon and I'm gonna see if 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 I raise it the same way if I'll have the same luck I have had with Eustace. I mean, she is a very phenomenal hunter, but it could just be straight up. I'm very, very lucky to have her, you know? Um, well, and, you, and you're a good handler slash trainer. You, you're, you've dealt with difficult breed of dogs. So it, it makes it a little bit easier than just a normal person who's had a lab. That's what I try right. to tell people. It's a little bit different mind state having this type of dog than just having any other dog that you have, at least in my experience. Absolutely. Definitely. And, um, and yeah, I think that, uh, that kind of, um, made me think of something and, and that is when you're, when you're training a dog that's living in the city and you're taking them on these trips or whatever, like you're having to cover a lot of ground on this dog's training in relatively short jumps or, you know, like, like in other words, like you, you have a trip now, you may have a trip like six months from now and you're expecting them in those two trips to learn a lot. Right. You know, with these puppies, the way that we raise them, and probably the way Jimmy raises his, um, they're exposed to hogs all the time, you know? And I would, like I said, I would take my little puppies down to the pen when I'm feeding the hogs. And- Big thanks to Mike C. That was some great information that he passed on to us. I'm just thankful to be a part of this network. I'm soaking it all up and I'm trying to give it all to everybody else. Uh, that's just part two. We still got several more parts to come in this Dogo round table. Uh, great wealth of information. Y'all stay tuned. If y'all were able to stay this long, please like, share, subscribe, throw me a comment. Let me know what I can do better. Uh, This is all a work in progress, and I'm still just trying to get better as we go. Thanks a lot for sharing. Peace.